So now that we have that cleared out of the way, there's another related notion which we shall dwell on for a little longer, perhaps in today's lecture, and then we'll move on to a new topic. Uh, and that is, again along the same direction, a dual map. So we've dealt with uh, dual spaces, dual bases, double duals, the isomorphisms that underlie these vector spaces. And now we talk about a dual map. So what is a dual map? Suppose you have suppose you have <coughs> linear maps from V to U. All right. These are, of course, vector spaces as we argued earlier. All right. Now let okay. So T belongs to this. then T prime, this is the dual map. So let's first see where it comes from and that's going to be interesting to see. So where does phi come from? Where do you think that's, does phi come, come from? See, I'm defining something new. I cannot use too many new things here. Everything else must be well known. So this T prime is the map that I am defining now. But I cannot define it in terms of things that I do not understand. So on the right hand side, whatever I have, I should know what each of them does. So <coughs> where does phi come from according to the definition? Do all of you? Exactly. Thank you. <coughs> right? So this is the way we define the dual map. Now if I ask you to think about uh, this point a little bit and maybe again related to things that you understand better, which are probably matrices, what can you think of? What image does this strike in your heads? For example, the moment I say T, you should think of a matrix from some n dimensional vector space to an m dimensional vector space and so on. So an m cross n matrix, right? Now when I talk about this, what does it remind you of in terms of matrices? Not really inverse. Inverses may not exist, no, as we've seen. But transpose, yeah, transpose is the answer. The reason why it's important to keep that in mind is because every time you see some results that seem familiar, you'll know why it seems familiar because it is exactly something you've dealt with, transpose of a matrix, okay? But nonetheless, we will see this in a slightly more abstract fashion without resorting to matrices or without going through that coordinate assignment and stuff, all right? So how does this work? This is of course the composition, all right? So once we have described uh, or defined the dual map, it is then befitting that we try and understand this map in terms of its two very important subspaces which are the kernel and the image. But if I just tell you, oh, the kernel of this is dependent on such and such very complicated objects, it might not carry much meaning. 
on the other hand if I can describe the kernel of this new map that I am calling as the dual map in terms of some known objects in terms of maybe this map then perhaps I will have some better insight. So that is what our goal is going to be to describe the kernel and the image of this new map this dual map in terms of what we understand about the original map. But please do remember that there is this to be borne in mind. This is a mapping from V to U. And this is a mapping from the dual of U to the dual of V. Okay. So this is a mapping from functionals on U to functionals on V. Okay. But if you think of matrices, of course, it doesn't look so weird. These are basically the row pictures of U. These are the row pictures of V. Right? We have seen that. When you talk about duals of Euclidean spaces, it's basically the columns flip to rows. That's what they look like at least. Right? Okay. So with that in mind, let's try and investigate the kernel and the image. Okay, so that is an interesting observation and you might think oh I suddenly plucked it out. Of course I know it so I cheated I just wrote it down like that. But once I do the proof you will see there is nothing much to it really. Okay. What is it saying? So let us try and understand first where these subspaces, these are subspaces by the way right. So kernel of T prime is a subspace of what? Maybe I should just write in small letters here. This is V u and T prime is coming from L u prime V prime. <coughs> so, so now the first check that they are indeed subspaces of the same vector space after all. That has to be. Otherwise there is no point, right? So let us take a closer, closer look. So T prime is a mapping from U prime to V prime, right? So where does kernel of T prime fit in? U prime. So this is sitting inside U prime. Where is image of T coming from? U. So where is the annihilator of the image of T coming from? U prime. So at least that preliminary sanity check has been carried out. That is very important to do. But now we want to see why this is going to be true. Okay. So let us do a quick sketch of this. Suppose <coughs> ah. So if something belongs to the kernel of this, it must be what? It must be a functional, right? Functional in what? Residing where? Inside u prime, right? Yeah? So suppose this phi belongs to kernel of t prime, right? This means T prime of phi is equal to 0. Let me just forget about the argument for now. We will bring that argument later is equal to 0. But this means that phi composed with T is identically the 0, but the 0 of what? When you compose phi with this, what happens? It means that does not matter what vector v you choose from the vector space v, 
because remember t is picking out fellows from v and mapping to u and then phi is further taking on that fellow from u and taking it to f because phi belongs to u prime. Please try and observe this, what's happening here. What is happening through this composition? This fellow is taking a fellow from v and mapping it to u. This fellow is then taking that fellow in u and mapping it to f. So the overall result is that a fellow in v is being taken to f. So that means any fellow from the vector space v that I pluck out here is what's happening to it. Yeah, it's being taken to 0. It's being killed off, right? Because it's, it's being an annihilated. So there you already have the hint of what is to come. So that means phi acting on T V is equal to 0 for all V belonging to the vector space V. Yeah. Any questions on this so far? This is true. But what are fellows like these also known to belong to? If you can choose any arbitrary fellow V and allow T to act on it, what you're essentially saying is that you give me anything from the image of T. So whenever phi acts on any fellow in the image of T, it totally annihilates it, right? Because you are allowed to choose V freely. This is identically true means you can choose any V and it's going to go to zero. If you can choose any V, like you can allow T to act on any V, it means you can choose any fellow in the image of T. Now any fellow in the image of T gets pulverized or annihilated by phi, right? So therefore phi belongs to image T's Okay, I have used the whole word image, image of T's annihilator. So I started with something in the kernel of T prime and I ended up showing that it must belong to the annihilator of the image of T. So one sided inclusion is done. But let me now just flip the direction. So I'll use a different color and again because I'm lazy I'll just go ahead and tell you to flip the argument and see that this works both ways. You start with something that pulverizes fellows in the image of T. It means that for every V that you can pick out, if you let T act on it, it belongs to the image of T and such fellows are pulverized by it. That means phi composed with t acting on any vector is 0. That means phi composed with t is 0. That means t prime by the definition of the dual map, t prime acting on phi is 0. That means phi belongs to the kernel of t prime. So all I'm going to do is and just get rid of the suppose here and flip it here, right? Any doubts? <clears throat> so this is indeed the case that there is both sided inclusion. Once something belongs to the annihilator of the image of T, it must belong to the kernel of T prime and if it belongs to the kernel of T prime, it must belong to the annihilator of the image of T. Sorry? Phi? phi? No, no, this is phi composed with t. It's not phi 0. It's phi composed with t. That's why phi, so first t acts on v and then phi acts on it. This is the composition. Right? Okay. Next, perhaps if you are dealing with finite dimensional vector spaces, we can also 
investigate what the dimension of this uh, vector space is going to be, right. So, dimension of <coughs> kernel T prime is going to be equal to dimension of, sorry, I'm going to use the shorthand IM now, yeah, image of <coughs> T prime. But just a while back, what have we seen? So dimension of image T plus dimension of image T's annihilator is equal to dimension of what? Tell me. Sorry? Image of T is coming from where? Image of T is coming from where? Yeah? So basically image of T just that is why we do proofs you see, we do not memorize results. When we did the proof you saw how we went about building this result, right. We took a basic a vector space, took its basis, extended it until we got the vector, uh, basis for the complete vector space. So start with image of T as that vector space, subspace, subspace sitting inside U, extend it to U, right and then the annihilator will complete the number of elements in the annihilator that completes the argument. So this is dimension u, agreed, fits in with what we approved, right. So then what happens? This is dimension u minus dimension image of t. But now I am going to use the conventional rank nullity theorem. Dimension u minus what is dimension image of t from rank nullity theorem? Think of t. Yeah. What is it? Dimension image T plus dimension kernel T is equal to dimension V, is it not? So what am I going to substitute there? Agreed? Make sense? When I say make sense, go back to the matrix picture. Think about what for a matrix T and its transpose T prime will be the number of rows and columns. What will they correspond to? The sizes of V or U or which ones? And check out if it is indeed true you know that the rank of a matrix and its transpose are the same because the row rank and the column rank are the same. So just see if this sort of fits in with that picture, does it? You agree that this checks out? See the ranks will be equal, the nullities won't be equal. Of course the nullities can, can't be equal, right? They can't be because there are different number of columns and rows potentially unless the, unless the uh, vector spaces are of same dimension, unless it is a square matrix, the nullities cannot be the same. If the ranks are same, the nullities cannot be same unless the vector spaces are of same size or same dimension. Right? And that's, that difference is exactly what is being captured through this, right. So when I say check out, it means basically 
get your hands dirty and think of matrices. Right? <laughs>